Do you ever get the feeling that today people seem to have an awful lot of things to worry about? There seems to be so many things which uh, cause people to uh, get upset, to be concerned about the future. Whenever you look at the news, there's all sorts of terrible things going on. There's uh, many concerns about the environment and uh, how animals are dying out, how they say that the climate is getting warmer, how it's going to become harder and harder to live. And then in addition to this sort of worry, there's these terrible wars which uh, seem to be bubbling up all over the place at the moment. And there's unspeakable evil being reported on the news as people do terrible things to one another. And these are things that we should all be concerned about. We also hear about natural disasters and suddenly you no know, towns being hit by earthquakes or hurricanes and there being a great destruction of property and loss of life. There's all sorts of things to be worried about. And then we're not immune from our own problems and concerns. We have difficulties arising in our lives we live in a world that is fallen, and that means that uh, all sorts of things will come along. It may be disease, it may be debt, it may be that we're victims of crime, or that we see difficulties coming into the lives of the people that we love. And it, when this happens, it's so easy for us to start to focus on the problems. And maybe with some of the problems in our own lives, we start to think, well, how can I sort this out? How can I get everything back to how it should be? And we can become consumed with trying to sort out our own problems. And when this happens, we do have a terrible tendency to just turn inward. And in many ways, we're walking around just looking at our feet, never lifting up our heads to see the bigger picture. Because the bigger picture tells us that um, despite all these things that are going on around us, all the things that people have to be worried about, all the terrible things that are happening, the big picture tells us that God is in charge. God is in control. And that's something each and every one of us needs to remember. In many ways, this is the take-home message from the book of Revelation, God is in charge and Jesus is victorious. That's what Revelation is about. And the book is written to encourage Christians who are going through difficult times. That may be difficult times because of the things of this world or because of persecution or even because of personal struggle. But this is a book that's written to encourage us. And we're encouraged because at the heart of this book, are these two chapters, Revelation 4 and Revelation 5, where we see that God is on the throne and God is in charge. And when we understand this big picture, then everything is put into perspective. For those Christians who were reading the letter for the first time, those Christians it was written to, and even for the Apostle John, this is a lesson that they really need to take to heart. We've just had the seven churches all being put under the spotlight. The Lord Jesus Christ has been invisibly walking among them and has just shared his verdict. Just imagine the Lord Jesus, if he was walking among the churches back then and seeing what was going on, do you think he stopped doing that yet? The Lord Jesus still walks among his churches, looking what's going on, and he does have an opinion about them. And what the Lord Jesus thinks about a church and about an individual believer is surely the most important thing in our lives. And as the Lord Jesus has looked at these seven churches, there has been praise where praise is due. Where there are problems, they have been highlighted. Even when those problems have been hidden from other churches so that outwardly the church looks okay, the Lord Jesus has shone his spotlight on them and revealed the problem, not to bring them down or tear them up, but to bring them to a place of repentance. There has been judgment and condemnation on churches trapped in serious sin. 
and that promise of forgiveness for all those who get their act together, turn to the Lord Jesus, repent, and they will be forgiven. And alongside this, there has been a lot of encouragement. These churches have found themselves facing difficult situations and the Lord has given them hope, hope for the future, a hope that one day things will be better for them. And we all need hope, don't we? Because life can be pretty tough at times. For the Apostle John himself, remember where he is. He is in prison because of his faith in the Lord Jesus and his uh, witness. These visions and messages must have really filled him with hope. Maybe as he was sent to that barren island in the middle of the Aegean Sea, he thought his days of ministry were over. Certainly those who sent him there thought to silence him. But the Lord came to him, gave him this vision, and with instructions to write to the churches, those words that will be a challenge and an encouragement. And now for John. His day is about to get even more interesting as we enter the next series of visions. And we got it there, haven't we? After this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And it was a door that he was invited to step through. And that door into a heaven is a door that only certain people can go through. I know that most of you have travelled overseas at some point, so you're familiar with passports and maybe having, even having to have a, a visa stamped into your passport to allow you to get into a certain country. Your passport is an important and valuable document. The Apostle John is now invited to use his passport to go home. As a member of the kingdom of God, John, like all believers, is a citizen of heaven. When God works in someone's heart so that they become a new creation, they adopt it into his family and become part of the kingdom of God. And for us, this means that this world that used to be our home is now just a place that we are traveling through. We look forward to getting to our true home, which is being with our savior. And it can be a long journey. And some parts of the journey are easy and simple and pleasant. And then there's exciting moments but there's also real difficulty and struggle. So often, when we're in those moments of difficulty and struggle, when the problems of the world uh, crowd around, we take our eyes off the end of the journey and we just look at our feet as if we're going nowhere. We need to lift up our heads. And the Apostle John is now given a tantalising vision in which he is encouraged to share about the end of the journey, about being in glory. He hears a voice, the voice that he heard in chapter one, which belonged to the Lord Jesus Christ, which invites him to pass through an open door into heaven. And as he goes through, he sees indescribable wonders designed to help him, designed to help the seven churches, designed to help anyone who reads the book of Revelation to look up and understand the big picture. The open door leads to the throne room of heaven and takes us to the heart of this entire book. God is on the throne. He is in charge and he is the centre of all things. This vision is the reality that every Christian should never forget. It is the big picture. So often we feel marginalised, forgotten, insignificant, on the losing side. But all of those things are false feelings. God is in control and everything that happens is according to his plan. That's everything that's going on in the world and everything that's going on in your life. And to highlight this control that God has, John is given a wonderful vision of the throne room of heaven. It is a vision that is given in the style of the Old Testament visions given to the prophets. A vision that could be taken straight from one of the Old Testament books. It's a fascinating chapter because there is no mention of the Lord Jesus Christ directly in Revelation chapter 4. It could have been written by Ezekiel or Isaiah before the Lord Jesus came to earth. It's only when the vision continues into chapter 5 that we see the Lamb is standing there at the centre of the throne. Revelation 4 by itself is uh, you know, just focusing upon 
the glory of God, of God on the throne. And for this part of the vision, God's presence on the throne is mentioned, but not really described. Just as is so often the case in the Old Testament, where there are visions of God, you have a description of God's glory, but you don't have a description of what he looks like. And the same is true here. He's just described as having the appearance of jasper, which may be diamond-like, and ruby. Precious, valuable, and glorious. Then in the same fashion as the Old Testament visions, his glory is described in more detail. We see an emerald rainbow circling the throne. And rainbows are lovely things. Um, we've seen quite a few of them today. I don't know if anyone else has seen rainbows, but... Uh, there's been quite a lot of rainbows today um, there in the sky. That's a wonderful optical illusion where we see the light being broken into the uh, different colours. And as well as it being something which is glorious to look like at, in the Old Testament, the rainbow has two meanings. In one sense, it is God's bow, a weapon which brings judgment that appears in the clouds, but it's also a sign of mercy, a sign that he will not flood the world again. And it's interesting that it's described as being like a, an emerald rainbow that circles the throne. And that's a bit more of a difficult one. The scholars don't know why it's described in this way at all. Um, yeah, in the um, NIV, it says a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Um, in the uh, Greek, it's picking out the uh, sort of greenness of this rainbow. And they struggle to think why the green band is so important. But as a scientist, I do have my own theory. I don't often bring my own thoughts to this, but um, I thought this was a reasonably uh, good one. And it's my own thought, so uh, it's just something to ponder. But biologically speaking, green can be described as the colour of life. And that's because almost all of the life on Earth relies upon a chemical reaction called photosynthesis, which uh, most of the time requires the pigment chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is the pigment that makes leaves green. Through photosynthesis, the plant gets the sugars it needs to survive and grow. And the waste product is oxygen. And most of the oxygen, if not all of the oxygen in our um, atmosphere, comes from photosynthesis. So we wouldn't live long without that reaction. And of course, the growing plant provides food. Food for herbivores that eats the plants, and then the carnivores eat the herbivores. So we see that this chemical reaction is there at the basis of life. Um, so a green rainbow around the throne could point to God being the source of life. But I will say that's my own theory. So uh, take it with a pinch of salt, but I thought I'd share it anyway. The throne itself is full of energy and power. From it emits flashes of lightning and rumbles of thunder. So we see that God's awesome power is on display. Then in front of the throne is the seven spirits of God, a reference to the Holy Spirit. He is there. And there is also a sea of glass, frozen, clear and beautiful. These things are so hard to imagine, aren't they? But it must be absolutely glorious. And the sea of glass may be a reference to how God has overcome evil. For the Jews, the sea with its constant waves and currents and whirlpools and depths was always a picture of evil. But an unmoving sea of glass, a frozen sea, would be a sign of God's victory over every evil power. And then around the throne, we're introduced to the heavenly court. 24 elders who sit on uh, other thrones and uh, there in the centre, these four living creatures. As Christians living in this uh, day and age, we often don't think much about angels and demons. And that all goes back to um, the Enlightenment and how that's influenced our society so that uh, we've become, in many ways, very materialistic about how we view the world. So as Christians, we sort of say there's God there and then there's the world. And we have a real tendency to forget about the spiritual realm that God also created. 
And it's only here and there in scripture that we get an insight into it. But God has created angels and angels fell and they became demons. And then there's these other beings who may be classes of angel or maybe something else, but they are there. And there's been quite a bit of debate about just who these are, especially the 24 elders. A common viewpoint is that uh, these are humans, 12 of whom represent the 12 tribes of Israel and 12 represent the apostles, indicating all of God's people. And that interpretation may be correct, but the alternative has some way that they are angelic beings, the counsel of God. There's a reference in Isaiah to God having a counsel. And when we look at chapter 5, we see that the 24 elders are included in the list of angelic beings rather than the rest of creation. So it could be that they are angelic uh, beings which signify the whole of God's people. This is one of those things that we're going to find out uh, one day. What is more important than their identity is their role. We see that they uh, are part of the never-ending praise that is given to God. The other group of angelic beings around the throne are the four living creatures, whose description seems to be a combination of the seraphim seen by Isaiah in chapter six. Remember, Isaiah saw that picture of these uh, six-winged creatures before the throne of God that were covering their bodies with the wings and singing out, holy, holy, holy. And then in Ezekiel chapter one, um, creatures which are sometimes described as cherubim were seen by the prophet Ezekiel. And they were quite similar, not exactly the same, but similar to the description that we have here. And we need to uh, recognize that as we think about these creatures, we only have a partial description. We read that each one of them is unique, with one being like a lion, then one being like an ox, another with the face of a man, but there's no description of his body, and the fourth being like a flying eagle. And like the seraphim, they have wings and they're covered in eyes. And that reminds us that nothing is hidden from God's sight. These magnificent living creatures constantly declare God's praises. And notice that the focus is not on God's love, as many liberal Christians would like it to be, or on God's wrath, as God has sometimes been depicted in the past with the days of the hellfire preaching. But... The focus is on what was always considered as God's preeminent attribute, his holiness, repeated three times, which points towards the Trinity. And it's only really been for the last 150 years that the church in Western Europe has put God's holiness into second place. And this change in the emphasis on God's holiness happened because of cultural trends that moved the popular description of God away from scripture onto something that was more acceptable to the people. So God's holiness was out and it was replaced with love. Love accepts all, but holiness separates good from evil. And holiness is understood in two senses, in separation and moral perfection. In John's vision, we see that God, even though at the center of his creation, is separated from it which is a reminder of his transcendence, how God is high above all. And his holiness will be seen as we work through the book of Revelation and we think about the judgments that he will bring. Broadly, when we look at scripture as a whole, God's holiness is seen in four different ways. Firstly, we see his holiness through the law, where God lays down the standards that he expects from his creation. The law is good. It is only sinners who want to escape from God and disobey him who see it as bad. By making the law known to the nation of Israel, God was opening the door of their understanding so that they could appreciate his mercy and grace. Secondly, the holiness of God is seen in God's attitude towards good and evil. Everything that is evil will be held to account for its behavior. Evil will never be ignored. Even if people get away with things for a while, even a whole lifetime, one day God will hold them to account for it. While anything that is good is acceptable to God, the only problem that we have is because of our sinful nature. Nothing that we do in our own strength is ever good enough, which is why we need grace. Thirdly, 
we see God's holiness in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, where we see holiness personified. He lived that perfect life, never doing anything wrong, in complete obedience to God the Father. And then he went to the cross, where he satisfied God's righteous wrath um, by paying for the sins of his people. The fourth place where we see God's holiness is in God's people. They are told, be holy because I am holy. They are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people called to declare the praises of him who called them out of darkness into his glorious light. Even though the reflection of God's holiness may be weak in our lives, God is working in us through the Holy Spirit and the process of sanctification so that we are being slowly conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's holiness is seen through us, and this is a powerful witness to the people of our world. The people around us, they have forgotten about God. They have forgotten about his holiness. They've re rejected the idea that one day they will have to give an account to him for their lives. They think that they are completely autonomous. They have no one to answer to. But everyone will one day answer to God. And by not realising it, it means that they are in a dark place, on the highway to hell, and they seem to be quite happy to skip along it to oblivion. We may be the only exposure they have to God's holiness before they find themselves face to face with the risen, exalted and glorified Lord Jesus Christ, who will sit on that great white throne of judgment, ensuring that every wrong is righted and justice is done. God is holy. We need to remember that he is holy. <clears throat> and we should give thanks for the mercy that we have been shown by this holy God. Because left to our own devices, we would never have come to our senses. It's only when the Holy Spirit works in our lives, waking us up, helping us to see and understand our own situation and how we stand before this holy God. And then look to Jesus and understand and receive the forgiveness that is available through him. So God is holy. He is also the one who was and is and is to come. The eternal one. That, uh, and this is another thing that separates him from everything that he has made. Even angels who were created during the first six days had a moment when they started, when they came into existence. Then they will live for the rest of eternity, but they're not eternal because they have a starting point. We are the same. There was a time when, before we existed, then there was a moment of conception, life, physical birth, and the start of an existence that would go on forever. Every human being is just at the beginning of this journey. For those who believe, we look forward with hope to the better days we will have when we are with Jesus. For those who do not believe, the temporary pleasures of this life are as good as it will get. But we need to remember that everyone will go on and on. In response to this, someone might ask about death and say, surely that's the end. That's the great hope of the people of this world, that when you're dead, you're dead and there's nothing after. But when we look at scripture, we see that's not the case. Death is not the end. Death is simply a punishment for sin. It stops people going from bad to worse. Imagine what it would be like if people lived forever, if there was no end to some of those tyrants of history that have brought such great destruction and pain around the world. Hebrews 9.27 tells us, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, it is at that moment of judgment that the place where we spend the rest of eternity will be declared. But everyone will continue to exist. But neither angels or people are anything like the creator who is there on the throne, the one who called time into being. He is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the one who was and is and is to come, the, the eternal one. As the living creatures declare God's holiness and greatness, the 24 elders join in in the cacophony of praise. 
They bow before him. They lay their crowns for down. And that's a reminder that the authority that they have is a derived authority. It's an authority that's given to them by the Lord God Almighty. And they declare, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. God is declared worthy to receive glory, honour and power because he is the creator. And that's another aspect of this uh, vision. The creature, creation divide, which is a poorly understood fact. In the world of apologetics, people will often ask, ask answer me this question, who made God? And this question is based on an incorrect assumption. People who ask that question think that God is a part of this creation, rather than God being the source of creation. But the God of Scripture stands transcendent above everything that he has made. He is outside of space and time. All living creatures receive the gift of existence and life from him. This is why God is able to tell people how they should be living their lives. This is why God has the right to judge a person, to see if they are good or evil. God is able to do these things because he has made them. And this is why God is at the centre of this vision. The universe is not centred on humanity. The universe is not centred upon you as a person. The universe is not anthropocentric. Rather, the creation is centred upon God. It is theocentric. He is in the centre. And it is right for creation to praise and worship him. Whenever we gather together as a church, we are joining this outburst of praise and worship that is rightfully given to the one who has given us the gift of existence, the gift of life. Then when we remember salvation and the hope for the future that the gift of the gospel brings, we have even more reasons to praise him for his mercy, grace and uh, the love that the holy God has shown us. And as we remember this vision, just like it helped those believers all those years ago, it helps us to get things into perspective. As we look at the incredible evil that's going on in the world today, these terrible wars where so many people, so many children are being horribly killed, maimed and injured, the concerns of the world where environmental devastation is happening and these natural disasters that bring such pain to people, whenever we encounter unfairness, persecution and difficulties, when we find ourselves facing poor health, difficult times, debt or persecution, this vision helps us to put everything in its rightful place. Remembering God's rightful place also helps us to live for the Lord Jesus. So often we get distracted by the good things of this world or we feel that we cannot share the gospel with our friends and family. We feel too weak or we're concerned what they will think of us, that they will reject and mock us. Remember that God has put his spirit into your life to give you the words of wisdom. We are adopted into God's family and we serve as his ambassadors. We need to uh, stop letting our, our fears, you know, stop us doing what God wants us to do. He will give us the strength and courage to carry out his will when we step out in faith. He is the glorious one that we serve. So to encourage us, never forget that God is on the throne, that he is holy, that he is in charge. He is the center of creation. He will make sure that everything is put right. One day we will see the Lord Jesus face to face. Remember that we are just passing through this world and we will not be home until we are with our Saviour. And when we remember all of these things, then and only then will we truly understand the big picture. Amen.